recording started. Uh, yeah, so this is the session to actually uh, discuss the CRD proposal with uh, the community, right? So basically, um, I, what we wanted to do, so I shared, uh, I think, the document yesterday is, yeah, there has been all kinds of uh, different approaches on how to define uh, the CRDs that we, I, that would be the release one uh, flavors to actually start from. So we did not change. So I, I'll go through the document, right? Uh, and then uh, I wanted to zoom in on the core principles and also the changes and probably why we have done so. Um, and then, okay, I, the whole idea is to open discussion. The, I, I think there is a number of things that probably still need uh, more fine tuning and stuff like that. But at least I think the big picture should be, I, we are trying to uh, ensure that that is, is uh, done, right? So John, can you do the moderation maybe for uh, when people ask questions and stuff like that? Because it's hard to- sure. Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll watch the hands. So we have a hand for Bao. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to ask a very fundamental question for all of us. Is the new document replaces the old document? It supersedes it or complements it? Can you please tell me? Tell us the idea problem. is that this would be the 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 our release one CRD, so it replaces it. But and I created a separate document because there were some fundamental changes. And okay, that's another discussion. I'm happy to merge it to the other side, but you'll see I, the content will be what is here probably. And of course, depending on the feedback, but this would be the new uh, proposal and this would be the reference going forward. Okay. So so the, the reason I ask, because it missed some of the instance set, uh, enough instance, enough instance set. So uh, we it's are- gone. It's gone. So, and, and we are, exp I, we will explain why we did that. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's it's basically gone. <laughs> Got it. Okay, thank you. That's it. Yeah. So uh, it's actually still there, but not uh, explicitly. It's implicitly still there, but not explicitly, and that's probably something uh, important to to get to, because I, I maybe just to answer that question, Bala, if you look at the blueprint package, I think you have gone through the document. So a package instance, right? So that contains what we call a blueprint that represents uh, that deployment is actually an NF instance or an, it's a, you could say, well, it's the original NF template or it's the original uh, NF instance set, but uh, the instance set was actually referring to a template somehow. So, but it's still there, but it's not explicitly uh, called out. And the reason why, and I think I Tal was basically the one that was proposing that uh, is that, and actually, I agree with him, is that if we build a construct like an NF template or an instance set, we are constraining ourselves to purely packet core. And so the whole idea that Tal had was, I, and Tal, please correct me if I'm wrong, but is to make it more composable. And so I, what Tal proposed is that, okay, we have a package, which is a great asset, so let's define individual components in there that we could reuse later on, potentially for other use cases. Of course, it's all a bit hypothetical, but for example, rather than defining an NF template or an NF instance set and what have you, we built a package which still represents something like that, but it has uh, composable uh, CRDs that are within it that as a whole represents that entity, right? So, and as such, we have a more, uh, let's say, uh, flexible and and composable uh, system that probably is for futuristic uh, uh, use uh, easier to adopt and and uh, and and complement. Yeah, that, that that was a good, <laughs> very good uh, a way of saying uh, saying it. Yeah, I uh, my own take on this is that uh, it's really that, but I I would call these. I'm trying to get us to, to have building blocks that we can assemble use cases rather than starting kind of from the top from a use case and then going down. And, and I'm also under the assumption that, that, that 
we all share that there are higher level orchestrators, right? There's OSS, there's service orchestration, there's all this stuff above that will, will give us those topologies, right? So we're not saying the topologies don't exist. They do exist, absolutely. But, um, and we'll probably have to reference them in some way if we're doing any kind of end-to-end -end, you know, uh, demonstration of how Nephio could work. Uh, but at the end of the day, those topologies are very use case, telco specific and all, all that. So if we focus on building blocks, then I think we're, we'll be able to do anything, <laughs> right? Anything that uh, users assemble into. Yeah, but, yes, if, I can, if, I, if I can just say, this is actually um, very much in line if you go back and look at the principles um, that we, we talk about of using, it's the same thing we talk about where we're saying rather than build an abstraction for something, use the existing uh, Kubernetes APIs in, in, the, in the sort of original discussion or principles, use the original Kubernetes APIs because we all understand those APIs and when we can construct things out of them. So what we, we the term we've used for this in their kept world is what we call package as interface. So rather than having uh, an abstraction that sits on top of it, that provides a constrained interface, you have an open package that people can modify and change. So like all of our condition stuff is based on this principle. And so what we're doing is actually taking that same principle and applying it up the next level and saying, yeah, we don't need an abstraction for uh, that use case. We can just take the building blocks of that use case and put them into a package and collect them together by association. And it's way more flexible. And as long as we understand those underlying building blocks, we can, we can operate on that as a set much more effectively and, and, and much more extensively. So I, it's actually a really great um, way to, you know, it's a, again, applying our principle again um, and, not, and, and not creating rigid abstractions that, that aren't strictly necessary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You so, hand, I'll just, so, yeah, thank you. Okay. So basically, okay. Uh, we still, Okay, we need, so we still at the moment have uh, a core class and a core uh, topology and maybe core is probably also debatable as a name, I think. Uh, so if people have suggestions, uh, <laughs> we are open for that. Uh, but so I, everything still I, so starts at the top because I just to, to give you a reference in core, you have packet core, you have voice core, you have a core in, in networking. So probably something we, probably the name will have to be uh, changed, but yeah, so the idea is to basically, uh, core is basically a collection of uh, various components that represents, uh, at the moment I would say it's typically, or at least in Nokia, we call this packet core. Uh, uh, it's an assembly of this, and there's a high level construct that would uh, do that. Uh, maybe before, John, so the idea also here is, Based on some discussions, some people believe that this should not be a complete standard-based nephew CRD, but more of a reference uh, or a reference proposal on how that would look like. Uh, John, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I, like, I think that you know, this is all a discussion. So, but based on what what we were just saying about what, what Tao was saying and what you, you know, we, what we were just talking about, like. We probably can actually treat what's represented in this document in your core class as just another package. It's like taking it up that level. Um, so, like, I think we should maybe we should just go through this. Yeah, just keep, through. keep an open mind that this is a proposal and this is under discussion. We're not saying it's fully baked. Um, I think that we can actually take it a step further. Um, and, and actually construct these core classes just as packages, but and the topologies would be embedded in those packages too, which is what Wim said right in the beginning. But I'm not sure the document reflects that. That's true. It's it's not there at the moment. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Now I I think uh, okay, another uh, philosophy behind the proposal here is the following: is that okay? So basically, the main building block is the packages, right? So the packages that represents uh, a specific network uh, function deployment, right? And uh, how do these packages get established, right? It's basically uh, coming out. So typically what you have is you, okay, people say I need a core. At the moment we defined 
uh, three criteria, but probably that's uh, up for debate. So we basically said it's either the capacity and we made I'd like small, medium, large. There is the the purpose. I So what I see in a lot of implementation is I, a lot of people segment for enterprise customer, like or even private wireless or mass market. So uh, that would be a, a reflection of purpose or uh, location could also be relevant if we are, I, for example, I think in Verizon, they have regional deployments. Uh, I know that certain enterprise, they have very targeted uh, areas where they operate. So that was the idea. But uh, in essence, uh, I, that's more the, the orchestration side of things, but basically the essence is the package, right? So what a package is actually a reflection of uh, a conversation or a set of uh, discussions that are happening between the persons that say, okay, this is what I would like to achieve with the experts like the network function engineers, the infra engineers and the network service designers together. They basically say, ah, for this flavor of a core, these are the set of characteristics or these are the uh, content that that package should contain. I need one interface, I need two interfaces, I need Azure IOV for this, I need uh, this. And so the package contains, uh, let's say, uh, mainly the infrastructure requirements that such a flavor of a deployment has. Uh, and that's kind of the baseline. So the way that package gets established is through that conversation of these various uh, people or roles, as we, we call them, that basically together define it and they document that into that package, which represents a flavor of that core uh, type of uh, thing. Okay, so maybe I'll pause here to see whether there is question. And there will be a package per type, so per NF type. So there would be one for UPF for that flavor, one for SMF and one for AMF uh, in that flavor. So uh, that's basically the idea. Okay, if that's clear. So, and as such, Bala, back to your point, at the end of the day, there's kind of an NF template uh, that we had originally, but because we don't have, I wanted to do this abstraction and, and yada, 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 that's why the package, as, as John and Paul was saying, is reflecting that. And it's a better way of doing so because we believe it's way more composable uh, going forward and more flexible, right? Cool, thanks. And, and it applies to the principle of config as data that we introduced in Nephew, by the way, because uh, as such, you basically, uh, you see what you get, it's all in there. It's composed without building another abstraction layer. Right. So, uh, yeah, so one other important aspect, and that's maybe, okay, relevant, maybe less for least one, but probably relevant going forward, is, um, <clears throat> Okay, we have, uh, at the moment, we define the role for network function and we define the role for infra, basically. At the moment, infra is rather empty <laughs> at this stage, but we believe that there would be a separate package going forward for infra. And the reason uh, is that the life cycle of that infra could be uh, different than the core instantiation. To give you an example, and that will be the case in release one, for example, we, I, uh, networks will be predefined. Right? So we will set them up probably during our Ansible playbooks or whatsoever. And then a core uses it, right? So uh, the idea also is that, that that would be a separate package because the life cycle of those two would be independent. Okay, Tal, you have a, a point or a question or a comment? Yeah, just a quick comment. And I, I, I might be, Bala, I might be uh, uh... Uh, presuming your question too, right? Because uh, of course I'm familiar with with how Red Hat manages infrastructure, and it has the completely different sets of CRs with ACM and all that policies. So um, you know, just to add to Wim's point, it could be a cat package, but you know, if if it needs to interface with something like ACM, it could be you know ACM concepts and things, right? So I, I don't think it has to stay in the in the cat package world here. Uh, we're leaving this as a placeholder for now. As Wim is pointing out, we're not really doing much with it, but I, it is a place where we can elaborate with more proposals in the future when we actually get to infrastructure. Yeah, <clears throat> so what I would, would add to that, in fact, and say that this is where we get to where we've talked about in the past of separating the APIs or the, the resources that define 
the provisioning and the resources that define the consumption. So we don't care how you've provisioned your infrastructure from the point of view of our packages that deploy network functions. What we care about is how to access that infrastructure and how to specify our requirements on that infrastructure. How you provision it could be manual, like Wim was saying, it could be with something like ACM, it could be with something completely different that's out of band effectively from, from, from Nephew, or it could be something like um, that's KRM managed and therefore can be also part of uh, the management plane of Nephew. Um, and so, but, but the consumption piece, so we have a resource for instance in here, like when we're saying that's kind of empty that defines a network, that's from the point of view of how these network functions need to connect. It's not from the point of view of what you need to know in order to provision that network. And so we use the same trick. At, at some point, if we want to do the provisioning as part of Nafio, what we do is we create a package that represents um, a, that network for provisioning purposes, but sitting in that package is an additional resource that identifies it for consumption purposes. So that's how the, the two get tied together when you're provisioning it with Nafio. It's the same thing we talked about doing with clusters. Um, if you're not provisioning it with Nafio, you might have a controller running within Nafio that discovers it based on your CMDB or your inventory system or whatever you have, populates that resource into the Nafio management cluster. Now, from the point of view of our network function deployment layer, it's just as consumable as if Nafio had deployed it. So this is the decoupling um, um, between how we provision, which could be in or out of Nephio using other technologies or not, um, but we can still consume. Yeah, tap. <laughs> yeah, sorry, so many points on this, but um, another aspect could be here interfacing with existing site inventories, right? Because we, many of us are familiar with ONAP A and AI, and you know other orchestrators have their own inventory management. Um, you know, just to underscore John's point that it is out of band <laughs> for Nephio. Of course, we we don't interface with all that. Those are huge systems in themselves, but, but, but this is the connection point, right? This is where we would be able to connect to those other systems. And I think we're all interested to actually see how that would really work, <laughs> how you integrate Nephio. But um, obviously for R1, we're not gonna do this, but uh, all the people are interested in this topic. And I know there are a lot because, you know, December and January, <laughs> We had several meetings talking about CRDs for clusters and requirements. Um, we, we kind of abandoned that uh, avenue for now because we really need to focus on, on, on the release. But um, I, I do expect there'll be a lot of interest in working on this later. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks, uh, uh, Tal, uh, John, and uh, sorry, I didn't raise my hand, I'll raise it. So, uh, so at this point of time, we are only uh, talking about network infrastructure components that is required for uh, the 5G core functions as uh, defined here, right? Just want to make sure. We're not defining the cl actual cluster creation or anything uh, uh, at this yeah, point. But, but uh, not at this point, but uh, going forward, that would be, I think, in at least, I, wait, so just to be clear with everyone, I think, uh, what is the name again? Uh, the person from Arna Sandeep, uh, I think. Sandeep, yeah. Sandeep is, uh, he has a, I, so there is one of the issues uh, in our project plan. It's a stretch goal uh, to actually do something for uh, cost of provisioning, uh, but it's kind of a so, nice to have. So it's like, a, but uh, it's not a huge focus. But yeah, it's uh, he's, he's he's working yeah. on. It. So 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 let me just sort of describe how that fits in here. Um, it, it comes down to what <laughs> again what. What we're trying to deploy is how it expresses its requirements. So when we're deploying a network function, we're already implicitly saying it's going on some cluster somewhere. So that that sort of already has to have been done. But but in the network function package, it needs to express that it needs to connect to some network. So we need that resource. Now we also do need the, the, we're we're basically sidestepping this cluster issue with a couple of assumptions. One assumption is that we, ha we have repositories associated with workload clusters. So now we don't need to know about clusters, we only need to know about repositories. So once we know about need to know about repositories, the thing that consumes repositories is, is the, the package variant set thing that fans out. 
that's all it needs to know about is, is where a repo is and how to put something in it. And so we're kind of sidestepping the cluster issue by, by associating individually with a with a, a, a repo. If we wanted to provision clusters, we just have to, we could do it any way we want. We just have to populate a repo resource. Like that's, that's that, that connects up to it. Later, our two, three, four, whatever it is, we're gonna break those assumptions and it's gonna get more complicated. But for now, we kind of are like just sidestepping it. Uh, Tal, because I think Val, your hands up. because you, Yeah, yeah Val, go first, please. Oh, uh, but, but, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to add, I know this is such a, a deep topic, but to add to John's point, um, yeah, a repository is our equivalent, a Git repository is our equivalent of a site. I'll just mention too that there's enough flexibility that it it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one relationship between site and Git repository. It could be a directory within a Git repository. So, you know, in terms of scalability, that might be, you know, thousands and thousands of Git repositories, but it, it could be managed in, in, in a different way. And I'll also point out that, you know, we're, for, for Google deployments, we're using config sync, right? So for us, the Git repository is a very trivial way to be a site because anything we push to the Git repository, config sync pulls it to the cluster, <laughs> to the workflow cluster. So I, I know there are other ways to, to reach uh, workflow clusters, but again, for, for Nephio, it's kind of just out of scope, at least at the moment, and we're, that's how we're treating it right now. It, it's simple yeah. enough for, for us. <laughs> we're, we're building these, we're, we're making these very constraining assumptions for R1. And, and exactly. because yeah. we need to reduce degrees of freedom. But like, eventually we'll have to break those. Also, I think maybe important to understand, I think Tal uh, touched, I, or touched in the comments already. Uh, so if you look to vendor, specific uh, capabilities, for example, let's say, okay, I have a set a, a certain uh, flavor of, of uh, a core and in the package. So there is two ways potentially to add vendor specific uh, pieces. One is you have, you put your own CRD in it, which is uh, there, uh, right? So that's one option. Second option is that we have uh, like these references within each of our CRs that reference uh, sp a specific uh, additional components. So also this allows a vendor uh, specific capabilities that for example, we have not defined, but for example, the vendor wants to, to have. You could uh, augment this package with uh, that type of uh, information if need be, right? So that's maybe also an other important thing to understand. Yeah, yeah and I, I even think that for, demo purposes i mean we could just put something in there with a fake vendor even though nothing is using it, it's just to show as a placeholder again I, I just love this placeholder idea because it allows us to put things in r1 even though we have no implementation right so we can just put some vendor crd there with fake uh, information right yeah yeah we did a little bit like that in the in the in the, in the workshop with the image config thing but like i think that What's going to make this clearer, I think, is some example packages. Yeah. And um, I think Wim has some examples of individual CRDs here, but like, I think we need to take it a step further and make some example packages. Um, and we'll also probably will find mistakes in how we're doing things, but like that will probably help us make it a little bit, a little bit clearer. Yeah, well, I just wanted to discuss or highlight uh, the thought uh, around it so that people... Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no. I think this is a good discussion. I just don't. I, I worry I that, yeah. that it's difficult for everybody to follow because there's a lot of context that might be hard. Um, yeah, yeah. Let, let's continue. I, we're, we're, yeah, we're halfway through our time. Yeah. So basically, I, that's I, if you look at it, that's the high-level concept behind the ID. Okay. I don't know whether uh, there is any major objections to this approach or not, but that's kind of the highlight. Then I, so the next step would be to go to the details. So there's two ways that we can do is we can go through each of the detailed CRDs or we can go through the example. I don't know what you guys uh, believe is the best. Maybe the examples are easier to follow than the, than the schemas. That's also what I thought, but Stephen asked yeah. me to put it at the back. So I put it at the back. So, so the order has changed. Uh, 
Yeah, well, you, you, you're supposed to talk about primitive first, and then you're saying that how to use the primitive. I thought that's actually much more, well, much more logical. Because, it's more because logical. examples can change. I mean, we may have different examples. Yeah, for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. And that's, I don't know. I'll let other people. To me, yeah, usually I mean, that, that would be my, my interpretation. First is easier than looking at the abstract thing, right? You look at a concrete example, and then you go back and look at the abstract thing, and then you go back and look at the like it's back and forth. No, but right? this is a this is a CLD spec. This is not a use case spec. That's the difference. Yeah, so it should be. But I think to your point, Stephen, and I agree, is this should be a separate document or a separate, or a separate repo or whatever. I do agree with that point. I I just see. In order to get a concept uh, understood, right? Uh, I think it's both important to understand the details of the CRD, which is actually the scope of the document. And but I also added bolted on the 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 examples into it. But I do agree with you. Actually, we should separate that and and maybe have different example documents or even repos where we people actually see what is actually behind. Right. I, I agree with that, yeah. That, because otherwise the scope is too big, and, and uh, I mean we, we are we are we are providing examples implementation too in the, as a community because yeah. otherwise it's just a CLD it does actually nothing, and but uh, but then and then and then for our one we'll we'll kind of have to identify what those are, uh, but then for now we publish CLDs we are publishing the primitives, yeah. So what does people take? looking at an example or going through the abstract uh, to the CRD details. Uh, I would propose to go to the example, but uh, I'm open for other suggestions. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with either. Yeah, that's fine. Let's go through examples yeah, in the interest of time. Yeah. So basically, okay, so I'll, and also, by the way, some of the text, uh, there is not every, I, so I also try to explain a little bit what should happen. There is also some pieces that need to be uh, aligned with what Aravind uh, has presented and where, what happens. So there, there is some work uh, to be done here. Uh, so, and as such, at the moment, there are two individual CR, CRs here. I so like, so the first thing that you start is, is core class and core topology could be, uh, associate in a package, right? At the moment, it's presented as uh, two individual CR, but uh, this also can work when, when they are presented in a package. So this is basically, I want a core uh, for the mass market, right? So that's the example. And it has, uh, it starts with capacity large, right? So the topology was, uh, the idea was, okay, it would give some more context uh, around it that we say, okay, an AMF, I'm going to deploy always centrally. It has a certain capacity of large. Uh, and then the SMF would be deployed on all the regions and the UPFs would be deployed on all the edges, right? So that's just an example. Um, and so that would be the input uh, that we would get. Now this again would be a reference uh, thing. So that's not our main, uh, so that's not the true blueprint packages that we talked about. So this will actually give us uh, information on which blueprint package that we are going to uh, use, right? Or consume, okay? And I, as I said here, that, that has to be detailed, but so basically, so here so is my question. I, so uh, we are assuming here that there will be a controller that will actually translate this into the, the packages, right? The package variants. Yes. In the moment, that is our assumption as a reference uh, implementation, right? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah this is the, this is the area I mentioned in the beginning where I, I suspect, like, we might leave that to humans and just construct packages rather than having a controller. It's less code to write and less. But I, I don't want to disturb. I don't want to the grass like I think I think there's I think package plus association might be sufficient for core topology for core topology and core and core class but we can debate that later yeah so yeah in essence what you have is there is a blueprint package and then okay if we do fan out and stuff like that there will be the content of this will be uh per repo uh, represented uh, where that uh, nf and uh, where that, uh, so based on the cluster, a certain NF type will be deployed. So what I'm representing here is actually how that package looks like uh, in the beginning uh, and uh, based on the selection criteria, right? So what would be in that package? So, and these would be the CRDs that actually Nefio mainly focus upon. Uh, 
so this would be, I, I call it network attachment. So this represents on how that core would be connected or one of the attachments on how that core would be connected to the network. So, and these are all individual CRs that are all contained in the package. So there would be one network attachment for entry. So what we say, it's connected to this network. It's we say this is an Azure IOV type and it uses VLANs. Okay. So for the N4 interface, so this is an example of a UPF, by the way. So uh, here we say this is the N4 interface. It would be an IP VLAN a CNI type. It's also a VLAN and it connects to this network. Right. And then we have N6. Uh, very similar. Also, uh, it uses Azure IOV instead of uh, IP VLAN, for example. Right. This is just an example. Then, I right. capacity. This is point of discussion. I think whether we have to split a, a separate CR for control plane or data plane. So at the moment, in the current uh, CRD, it's a single capacity that has I actually four uh, attributes or four properties. One is the uplink and I so max uplink max downlink and then max sessions and max subscribers I think uh, but I, that's I, there is people which have uh, uh, probably different opinions on that so but at the moment that's one CRD that has these four properties of course for a UPF I only pick I picked only the throughput ones but it's just I that's how you show the flex or potential flexibility I'm not saying that this is the way to do it and then we also have a, a data uh, network name that uh, a DNN, that is the internet. And we say we need a pool and we can have multiple pools uh, if you want to extend it, that uh, has a certain size and how it's connected uh, to the network. So that is, this would be the content of such a package uh, that represents a certain flavor of a core. So for example, if you would have private wireless, as an example, you could say, I only have uh, one network. So you only have one network attachment instead of three. And you could say, ah, uh, it's I saw the CNI type uh, is, is Mac uh, VLAN or something else, right? Uh, and, and I don't use VLANs, but I just uh, have a, a, a native interface. So without any uh, sub interfaces upon, that's also possible. So that's basically for each of these, what I call uh, core deployment types. This is uh, the content of such a package that represents uh, something like that. And and who uh, how gets this established is first of all vendor input, right? That uh, together with the network function designer and the infra engineers and the network service designer collectively uh, gets established, and that those packages would be put into the system and you have different flavors for various use cases and deployment scenarios. And uh, yeah, that's basically the idea. So I sometimes also, another way of expressing it is I, if you look today, you go to a public cloud and you say, I need a flavor of a virtual machine. And here are some characteristics. Uh, it has to be 16 CPUs and, and so much memory and this disk. Uh, so it would be something along those lines of how a blueprint package, uh, what it would be. Okay, any questions or comments around this? Okay, and so, I, yeah, Bala, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Vim. I think it's it's uh, really appreciate you putting this example together. It's very helpful. So as I was going through this uh, last night, I was I had this thing in mind. So uh, essentially, we're talking about a particular flavor for a fuzzy core deployment. Then we are almost assuming a greenfield deployment um, where uh, every function is going to be deployed. Uh, so since uh, I mean I didn't. Do, I'm not uh, not from a. I did not. I'm, don't work for a service provider, so I don't know about this. But is are we considering the cases where, for example, uh, the these things are from different vendors and something? Let's say UPS 
is already deployed or we are they using this to in, uh, deploy only one function uh, are we uh, i just want to make sure if i think that may be a valid case in my view in a more brownfield uh, area and then in that case just want us to think through how this particular workflow is going to work for that yeah you want to respond, John, or should I? Uh, I'm happy to. Yeah, I, I, have, I have something to say there, but I'm sure you do too. Um, I, I think this is actually a great point that why we might do it as a, a package instead, because then it's not up to us. It's yeah. up to that particular organization and that conversation that we talked about. And they'll say, huh, in our organization, we want to offer uh, this ability to deploy this core, but we've already deployed these parts of it in these environments. So in this particular package, it's only going to include this function and it's going to be constrained in this way. And it's going to be pointing to some other piece of infrastructure or, or, or other piece of the core that already exists. And so it, it, it's that composability, that flexibility in packaging things willy nilly, really, um, is, is, is what would allow us to do what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking in the same lines, John. Just wanted to make sure that my thought process is the right way. Yeah, thank you so much. But, but it's it's a bit it's a line now. Of course, we have to look at all the details. But but for example, I one of the examples I I so this is one uh, type, right? But for example, if you say mass market as the starting point that we say, you could say it's Ericsson AMF, it's uh, Nokia SMF, and it's uh, uh, affirmed uh, UPF or something like that. It's possible. Right, and you could even say for this, for this flavor, for I, for example, I, what I see in a lot of use cases happen is for mass market they have a certain vendor for a certain type, for enterprise they have different flavor of the vendors, right? So what you do is you basically build the packages based on the flavors and the selection process that people have done, and they have the flex. I so. It's that conversation that allows them to build the right components together and make it composable. That's, I think, the, in my view, the beaut, the the nice thing about the proposal on the table, is that yeah. we don't define this predefined abstraction CR, but it's actually a collection of things, and then the composability is uh, up to the consumer rather than than us trying to define every use case, which is probably impossible. Yeah, makes sense. Right? Yeah. So yeah, and then here, I so we have to update stuff, and that's also I do agree that it's better to split this document than or these things off. Uh, that we have one way to to describe this, but then our hydration process would kick in, right? Uh, and so then the injector starts to get. So I try to give here an example of the UPF deployment. So, and Bala, to your point. Uh, yeah, most likely this might already have been included into the package based on what Aravind presented. So I did not align that yet, but I just wanted to represent that, okay, this would be expanded. And then uh, later on when we have IPs and VLANs, uh, it would be resolved and, and updated and what have you. So that uh, this is kind of the hydration uh, stuff that we talked about that would be applied uh, to the system. Yeah, Tal. Yeah, so uh, this is a question really, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure I would work myself, but th there would need to be some sort of hydration controller, right? And um, it's very, it's not, it's not merely use case specific, it's also vendor specific, right? Because different UPF implementations from different vendors would need different properties here, you know, I don't know if we'll do it as an extension or, you know, the meta model, <laughs> we haven't really finalized, uh, finalized that, but it goes back to you know my presentation on Kplug. Like, would the idea be that every vendor has their own controller doing this, or could we have a central controller that manages hydration, allowing for vendors to plug in their own code to to handle that? Right. Yeah. Um, sure. we, we are only doing free five DC right for the yeah. for use case, so that's very straightforward. But we probably should take into account that. Um, there would be other implementations. <laughs> so I think so. Maybe John, let, if I can, let me. Can I first go first? So, yeah, right, okay. uh, you. so there is. I, I see different uh, flavors. So in R one, our controllers 
can be either functions or controllers, right? So this, it will be a mix and they are, I think they are these independent uh, entities that act based on the conditions, right? So that's what we are or have done for uh, R1. I see the way to do vendor plugins, uh, there is two ways. One is that they are part of the hydration process and that they uh, have functions or controller that are happening at the hydration. Or the alternative is that uh, that this will be a generic uh, hydration that is vendor independent. And then once you go to the workload cluster, you actually the operator that the vendor uh, uh, has is going to make it vendor specific. I think these are the flavors or the options that we have uh, potentially, or at least that's the one that I've, or I, I can Right, think. but if the vendor wants to do shift left work, then it would have to and it's, yeah. happen here. So, so yeah, so, so that's why I'm not exactly sure how it could work. It, it could be a sequence that is our generic controller does its work first and then hands it off to the next phase where, where there's another controller so, or some kind of integrated work where you actually do it together. So I, I don't think we're yeah, quite yeah. sure about that. That's something we need to tease out. Agreed. So the, the way I see that working, like I actually think we we kind of had that solved already. Um, so like Wim said, there's two, there's two points of uh, two ways um, of interact, of, of, of modifying the function configuration. Uh, or the, rather that the uh, the network the, the package configuration um, one is through uh, KRM functions so KRM functions are very simple things kind of like your kplug where they can just they take a, a bunch of resources in and they spit a bunch of resources out and you can do whatever you want to them as long as you're hermetic and then controllers are the same thing but they add a bunch of uh, the ability to reach out to the outside world which adds a bunch of things like, oh, you need to, you know, worry about failures and manage status and all this stuff. So those two points, the, the idea is that you can add, the package author can add anything they want to that. And that means the vendor, the vendor is one of the package authors, right? The, pack, the package is constructed by vendor and organization together. And the, 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 the vendor or people in the organization can add those KRM functions or if they have things that need to gather um, not runtime, but config time, sort of what we're calling shifted left, but needs to interact with the rest of the world, like we're doing with IPAN, they can, they can add a controller if they have, if they have vendor specific things in, the, in, that, in that area. Now we can work to make it easier to build controllers. We can, I don't know, you can make, we can work to make it a little easier to build functions, although they're, they're, they're sort of very little like little configlet type things anyway. Um, so I'm not sure that we need an additional um, insertion point. One of the, one of the, so we have the ones that are built into the package. So those are in the, that are going to run every time you make a modification to the package. Those, those KRM functions, we did talk about the package variant we're talking about, the package variant resource, which is what um, cost, it, potentially being able to execute a different set of functions that would work a little differently from a pipeline perspective. And then you have the follow-on stuff after uh, fan out where the package uh, conditions don't even have to be after fan out. Any, any package can take advantage of all the condition stuff, which is post uh, a coordinated post uh, um, draft configuration. So I'm not sure we need an additional um, lever in there, but I mean, I'm, I'm open to it if, if we think so. Yeah, I think it's worth discussing or going a bit deeper upon uh, on different options, probably, uh, I think, sure. John. So we have to look at all the flavor because I, I think it's something that I, I think we discussed it before that we should answer rather sooner than later uh, in terms of the, how a vendor plugs in because a lot of yeah. people have already asked questions on how it would work. So I think it would be, okay, let's first yeah, have yeah. And baseline, then... baseline established and then we can uh, work on how, how that would work. But I think we have... Various ways, so it's I. But uh, what, what I like at the current in the current proposal is, we are not limiting ourselves to one way or another. We have various insertion points on how it can work, and and I think that's that's already nice. Yeah. Yeah, and just before Tim goes, I'll just say two more things. Is is I, I didn't mention, of course, the the operator side of things. That's also there too. There's also what we call apply time. So that's between, that's before the operator kicks. It's like at the time you, you apply the resources to the 
Kubernetes workload cluster, you could do stuff. So webhooks are an example of how you do apply time, but we can actually do. And then we've, we're also talking about how we integrate each of these insertion points with Helm. So we are having another discussion on another, uh, 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 and we could, because I know there's existing investment in Helm. And so we, and, and that's one mechanism for doing this kind of config manipulation. So we can plug it in at different parts of that flow. But I do agree that we need, I have an old diagram that talks about here are the, the life cycle of a package and here are the insertion points where we can make mutations. And so I would suggest we go back to that and see if what I've described there is sufficient or if there's more we need, um, but, but uh, Tim. Yeah, so I, I'll let you guys finish your question on controllers. I had a question on the NAG creation. Oh, okay, I think we're done. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more or less done. I did. Uh, we can go. Yeah. Back. So, so good. Now, go down to your last page there, Wim, because it's just a question. Now, keep going to the last page. This yep. One? There you go. Okay. So, you say lastly, a NAT is created, which defines the specific parameters needed for the interface and attachments to the NF. So, how does that NAD that you just created? How does that get correlated back to the request that you made? Is it by the name of the network instance? Is that how you're doing that binding or are you going to inject the, the NAD uh, identifier? So the way it works today is the controller uh, that sits in the workload cluster, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the way network attachment definition uh, work is through an annotation within the pod, right? So what happens is when the uh, operator or controller that sits in the workload cluster injects that annotation that references the NAD uh, into it and that's how they bind. So this, so so here we just uh, pull it down, but the controller that lives in the workload cluster, or at least that's what how we did it in the POC, uh, is that when the pod gets created uh, that represents this, will do that annotation, and as a result, that's how network attachments. I, I call it the late binding. Is, uh, is so so the binding doesn't occur here because you okay. said lastly a NAT created and defines right. Okay. And the binding happens at the workload. <laughs> cluster uh, level yeah okay so so the creation of the the nad and the binding happens in the workload cluster right yeah so this is basically yeah, I, I didn't get that from this right I, I didn't know what you're exactly trying to do okay so at the moment what we are doing is that uh so what is what actually in the package is actually all of it but there is actually two crs in the package in that are relevant for the workload cluster. The one is the UPF deployment that I, that is here, right? And and mm -hmm. then there is, if you look to the, uh, there is also there is one for every network attachment that you saw before here, for mm -hmm. these, right? We create uh, not yeah so these ones we create a knot with, and I thought this was this question before whether you do shift left or shift right right but in at the moment in the shift left model like the VLAN, the CNI type, the version, all of these things gets uh, hydrated uh, in the management cluster, but it's just, it's not yet applied. So it basically, here is a CR that is uh, how, I, that that would be in the workload cluster be implemented and applied to the cluster. So then uh, when that is hydrated and approved by the person to say, hey, I'm I'm okay with this, then it it's config sync takes that, applies it to the cluster because for the way that these cap packages work, so all of these CRs, they have an annotation or a label, I don't, I forgot, to say uh, this configuration is not to be applied to the cluster. So there is a specific uh, 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 key value that represents, hey, this can be applied to or the cluster or not. And Config Sync uses that to know whether to apply or not, right? But basically, I, from this package, network attachment definitions that we were talking about, as well as the UPF deployment, are the two CRs that actually will be used at the workload cluster and then uh, applied. And then that late binding happens there, but it's not happening here. So this is basically a content that we prepare in a package per cluster, per NF type. Okay, so so go back down to the UPF deployment. I'm just trying to make sure I understand. When that light binding happens, right? you what what changes in this particular? Let's just take in N6, right? 
Um, what changes? What will happen? What will change? So, in, so that, in, in this, when you when you when you uh, do the late binding. So what happens basically? This UPF deployment at mm. the workload clusters is input to an operator that is a free five GC operator. Right. That operator creates a deployment, uh, uh, specifically to all the requirements that came here. Mm -hmm. In that deployment, you in the pod uh, spec, you basically build that annotation, that late binding reference, right? And okay. that's that's how uh, then the free 5 gc gets spun up, right? And because we have that annotation in the uh, deployment spec and in the pod, that's how the late binding happens through the multis. Uh, we use lab, uh, standard multis mechanisms to do so. So does the does the CR either? Uh, as part of the spec or the status that's in the workload cluster, does it have that that correlation between we're talking about N6 here, the N6 and the the NAD that it was bound to? Yes. So so the it has a reference to it. Yeah. Okay. And it's just not shown here. That's oh, no, that's what I was sure. that's what I was trying to drive. Yeah, so we we have to add that. So I stopped at the management cluster. So we have to add the part of the workload cluster. Got it. Okay, I'm good. I was just like, that was the last cookie. I couldn't find the draft. <laughs> yeah, we have to add that. Uh, yeah. All right, man. Thanks. All right. So I think I okay. We have a small team, so we probably I. Does anyone have major objections to this uh, framework? Of course, there will probably some details uh, that we have to flush out on some of these things, because the whole idea is that we would send this document. Maybe we can uh, remove the example uh, if we people believe that, or we send this document as is to SIG1. We probably will have to represent it probably in one of our meetings, I think, uh, John, given the amount of people that we have here, probably we should uh, spend some time on it. But I, if anyone has major objections against uh, what is on I, what is on the table here, because that would allow us to make progress. Because from I, the way I look at it, this is kind of fundamental in how we progress. Because all our work is probably depending on it. Uh, that doesn't mean that every CR how it's defined it cannot change, and we can split it apart. But I think it's I, what's most important is the the framework that sits behind. I think it's a great starting point in my view. Yeah. Thanks, Paula. Yeah. Okay, then I propose that we send it to SIG1, right? And then we plan some additional uh, effort for review within our SIG automation as part of the regular meetings. And then we take it from there. Yeah. So, I will, yes, agreed. I. Oh, <laughs> um, that's part of it. Well, that's part of it. Anyway, uh, so the question is, how is SIG1 going to understand this? How do we explain it? Do we want to, um, we can send it as is. Do we want to set up a, they have a meeting on Monday. I don't know if they but I this if we need a separate meeting with people that are interested, because maybe it's too big of a group, that we should think about the logistics of it, I guess. Um, there's I, a lot of context that this group has that they don't have. So like, it's like, how many hours are we gonna spend trying to explain it? But I think, yeah, so I, okay, in the meeting, I think you were not there uh, on Tuesday uh, this week, uh, John, so, but I basically told them that we are working on this. Okay that we would send this. And of course, I, I told them that we would uh, present. I, we wanted to present this because okay. there is so much content. So that was the I, what I suggested to them. And they I think they were okay with that approach. Okay, awesome. Yes, just to, <clears throat> just to let you know, <clears throat> there is no cigar meeting next week, at least on the calendar. Oh, That's it's, 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 it's once in oh, two Oh, good, that gives us, okay, good. That gives us more time. I was worried, like, I'd like to have, like, some example packages. Okay. We can work on that next week. But you can send this document as is and just say, we're working on more examples to show concretely yeah. how this is operation, how we operationalize this. Like, I think that will make it, it's it's super, it's still pretty abstract. And so, like, I think that will make it a lot clearer if we can do that. 
Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think Salah, they also said that they would meet more regularly. But I, you're right, is there? There's not. Uh, there hasn't been any invitation sent out. Uh, yeah. But they Julia, haven't. Even, they haven't yeah. finalized that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, besides, they also not using the um, the the PMO admin account. <laughs> oh, we have to. Yeah. Gosh, we have to. So help. you can't you can't just out of the blue schedule your own meeting. <laughs> not 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 from outside. Yeah, we need to NFL. help them with the logistics a little bit to, to get yeah. to, so they understand how to do it. But um, okay, are we Wim, are we all set then? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, I really appreciate everybody's feedback. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I would like to thank all of the people. Uh, so this is, by the way, not my work. So this is input from various people, right? Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for helping. So this is actually community effort, <laughs> if you will. But uh, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Wim, for coordinating and, and leading this effort. So that's Absolutely. pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, John, I mean, if I may ask ask a question, no, I'll raise a hand and ask a question. Uh, so what does this mean for uh, the, the the sequence diagram that we discussed? Does it change anything at all? Ah, it's a great question. So what I'm thinking is that now that we have this, we can think through and I hope to make, and I'd love for anybody else to do this too, but I was thinking this afternoon, if I have time, I'm gonna think through what the implications of this are on the little uh, task forces or whatever we wanted to do. Like we probably want a task force specifically around how we define these different requirements. I think Tal's super interested in that. Um, we also gonna want a task force around this piece we just talked about of like, what are the insertion points for customization along the way, you know? So like the hydration side of things. So I, I mean, one way we could divide it is management cluster and workload cluster. I don't know if that's sufficiently granular, but like we, we should think it through and see what, but I think we should, like I said before, land on somewhere between three and six task forces um, that can kind of take those things that we put on the board, Bala, and kind of um, refine them, take ownership of, and we'll, we'll label, we'll create area labels, we'll assign areas, and we'll assign some team leads in those areas, and people who are interested in those areas can gravitate towards them, maybe we'll create Slack channels for them. Like, we'll, 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 we'll execute those semi-independently, right? That's the whole idea, is that we shouldn't all have to talk about everything all the time. We are very uh, hierarchical at the moment. Uh, we, if we want to make progress, we have to be more divide and conquer, I think. So this would allow us to do so. Yeah. Does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay, uh, I think we better go. I'm late for another meeting. Yeah, thanks all. I'll stop the recording. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.